there's a reality that people often forget when they get on the internet, when they decide to become a Facebook fan, when they decide to friend out their time and effort and energy with investing and divesting themselves of all this information that they think they find on the internet and telling people irresponsibly that either some earthquake is coming or the sky is falling or that there's some disaster that's going to happen to them. They create fear. They don't think about being responsible for the information they're giving. They are standing up in the theater while the movie is going and screaming fire, which is illegal, and you could be sued. Now, if we have that kind of attitude in our words as well as our posts on the internet, then suddenly we would take accountability and responsibility for saying some of the false things that are being portrayed in the name of God. We wouldn't be so quick and so fast to pass out fallacies that are false ideas that are ad hominems or straw man arguments or taken from some false internet site that's just a blogger who's probably a 16-year-old kid who has gone out and built this cute looking website because he took a template from here and he took a few facts from there and he combined the two and he made up a false political theme and now he calls it the end is near or he calls it some other crazy idea. Sadly, we have lost perspective on the reality of God holding you and me accountable for our words. The very lips that we speak with, the very tongue that we have, the very words that are spoken from our mouth to God's own ear is what we are going to be held accountable to. Jesus will hold you accountable for every single idle word spoken. That's what he said. He didn't lie. So people lately have come back at me at times and they challenge me on comments because I will say to them bluntly, no, that's not what the Bible says or no, that's not what the scripture says. And suddenly, you know, it's as though I have become full of pride and ego because I think I know it all. <laughs> it is so simple to Google it. You know, all you have to do is type in Google whatever scripture you want. You can find out if it's really in the Bible or not. There is no reason for there to be this deceiving of people on the internet. If you are sitting there on your Facebook, there's no reason why you can't just flip over, even if you're on a smartphone, slide it over, put in Google, type in the words, and you can find out the truth, literally. You may have to wade through a few websites and look at them and use your brain and start thinking about it. But to have people come out and say, oh, well, I saw a bunch of tanks going by, you know, on the railroad tracks. So it must be that the federal government is shutting down the state because I saw the tracks in California. So they're getting ready to put martial law in order. Oh, please. You know, never mind that there's two bases at each end of the tracks and they're moving tanks from one track, one base to another. And now they create this hysteria of fear. And then you get people that they just click on the internet for the first time and they see what you posted and they go, oh no, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. And they run around crying wolf and pass it on to someone else. You see, the world is coming to an end. And the intelligent people are losing the battle for the faithful few that are willing to examine the truth and to prove all things and hold fast that which is good. That's what you need to do. You need to examine yourself to see where maybe you kind of stepped off the right track and you're kind of like off in left field, you know, screaming at the top of your lungs about some issue that you think is really important? Or maybe you need to step in the right field, way out in right field, and see if that issue is really that important. Or maybe you could take left field and right field and bring it into home plate and realize that as part of the team that God has put together, 
He wants you to share Jesus to those that don't know him. Because we don't need people in the bandstand, in the grandstands. We don't need people standing up and shouting about how, Oh no, it's all ended. No, God help us. When the reality is, with Jesus, we have salvation. And we are assured of that salvation. The assurance that we have in God is that we are called for a specific purpose. We've been designed to do something. And you need to figure out what that is. Because if you're in God's way, He will remove you. If you are causing division and strife and angst and anxiety and causing people to turn away from God because of fear, then you might be doing something you never thought your words would do to other people. Have you thought about maybe people killing themselves for fear? But you may be portraying the world as being. You see, conspiracy theory people have this whole idea that every time that the sun passes some coronal ejection, a CME, coronal mass ejection, that it's going to fry the earth. So they come out with this long list of, oh no, it's happening again, another coronal mass ejection. Only they don't say another, they say, it's a force seven, it's a force five, it's a X. Little do they realize, the worst coronal mass ejections we had were back in the 80s when we actually did wipe out one or two satellites. That was about it. A few people might have got some sunburn, you know. It's about the extent of all the massive coronal mass ejections that we've ever had. But someone who doesn't know that listens and says, I heard the world was ending in a few days because we're going to get hit by another one of those corona mass ejections. I mean, solar storms. I mean, you know, you know, the, 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 the sun was throwing this flame out and I saw it on the internet and it's going to destroy the world in a few minutes because it's going to be on. It's Tuesday. Oh, wait a minute. It's Tuesday. It happened yesterday. Oh, now that I think about it, maybe I've been misled by someone. Do you get it? The point is, can you focus in on what God wants you to do? Can you choose the reality of what God has demonstrated to you that your purpose is in life? Because he said for you to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow him. But when you follow him, that means you should be asking Jesus what he wants you to do. Because there's a lot of people that post a lot of information that's false. And then someone comes along and thinks that they're, oh, I'm going to put this all over the web so that everyone can get more of this because, oh, it looks so cute. It sounded so right. You know, it was so dynamic. And then you find out down the road that, man, it wasn't true at all. Maybe that's why we have some people God chooses for the web ministry. Maybe God chose you for the web ministry. Maybe God intended you to sit back, look at the masses as they are convincing themselves of false teaching and doctrines, and for you to share with them the love of God, so that they would be inspired to turn to God, but not to you. Maybe you could ask God what it is that you should do about your time on the internet? Or is it all about me and mine and getting and doing? You know, after all, it's my Facebook, it's my Twitter, it's my, I'm trying to think of all of them, it's my blogger, it's my, <laughs> I should know, I, I post on all of them all day long. It's my blogger, it's my Facebook, it's my, my website, it's my, Go Daddy. <laughs> it's my mm, boy. WordPress. It's my whatever it is. And of course, you know, I only 
post those things that are true because I check them out first. I make sure that I pray over every information set that I throw out there for people to read because I know that God is going to hold me accountable for my participation in whatever it is I'm joining myself to and promoting that. Or are you just part of the crowd and you're going along with the world and its ways of just being a tabloid and passing out tabloid information? Because you see, in these last generation, in this last generation, in these last days, as we participate in this last generation, we're seeing a huge amount of false doctrine, false teaching, false information, and anti-information out there. Things that would lead a person away from God as opposed to towards God. You see, anything that takes away from God is anti. So there is a spirit of what we call anti-Christ out in the information age. It's called distraction and deception, but really what it amounts to is the spirit of anti-Christ. It is a way and a means with which to divert the focus of a person's eyes, heart, and soul from Jesus to doing what they think is important in making themselves out to be gods on the internet by passing out candy laced with cyanide. Because a lot of websites that are out there that now have these weird sounding names, Earth News, uh, Save the Earth News, um, I'm trying to think of all the greeny peace news. They have these outrageous news stories that come out and people think they're true. And then when I go in and I look and I say, no, no, it's not true, it's false. Then they say, well, you're, you know, who are you? I said, look at the website. On it, they have a disclaimer saying this is for entertainment purposes. Did you do your homework? I don't ask them this, although I should. But did you do your homework? Did you research your article before you posted it? Did you do what most news stories do when they have two sources from opposite, hopefully extremes, from opposite inputs? Because most people, if they're Democrats, can blame the war on there were no weapons of mass destruction because there was a flat out lie told by a, an operative, you know, in the information agencies, you know, that they based all their information upon this one person who said he saw them. And so 2020 did a special one and everybody kind of knows the story now about how that got blown out of proportion and it came from different sources, you know, European and and from, you know, American and, you know, CIA and all that stuff and how that information became disinformation which led to incorrect actions which 10 years later, <laughs> though some good is accomplished, the reasons why aren't there. So you see, God wants you to always be based upon truth because one of the clothing parts that Paul talked about when he said that put on the full armor of God was called the belt of truth. And the reason why we want to tell the truth and not fallacies, and the reason why we want to tell truth from scripture and not from opinion is because when you take off the belt of truth, you're going to get caught with your pants down. And it's pretty embarrassing because a lot of people that I deal with daily put out a lot of bad information and they are caught embarrassed and mad, sometimes at me, for how poorly they researched the information they put out. And all I can say is, would you rather be embarrassed now about misleading someone and then pretending like it's not that important or for Jesus to say to you, did I tell you to do that? I'm holding you accountable for every idle word spoken in secret as well as in person. So, which would you rather have? 
Would you rather be found faithful to the truth? Or fallacious, which is a word meaning that you follow fallacy, you follow fables, you follow these <laughs> made up lies is what they are. You follow the Antichrist, you follow the spirit of Antichrist, you follow the spirit of error, you follow all these things that sound good on the surface, they look good, you know, they kind of go, ooh, ah, wow, ooh. And then you kind of look at it and you go, well, you know, this little part of it seems to be wrong, but we'll accept it all because the little part that's wrong, it's more important this big part that sounds right. Don't fall for that. If you are a disciple of Jesus Christ and you're trying to pursue that which God has given you to do, then having utmost is one of the best ways to challenge yourself, to examine yourself, to look at what you're doing and what your focus is. Because if it isn't on Him, you're doing the wrong thing. You're focused on maybe ministry or maybe personality or maybe sensationalism or tabloidism or some kind of sense, sensory perception that you think you feel like something is discernible. Let me give you a short course on discernment. Discernment is very simple, simply this. The spirit inside will provoke you immediately to say, something's not right. Now, you may not know what it is. That's the gift of discernment. God causes you by the spirit of truth which is in you to know something's not quite right and when you first read it you either sensed it that it wasn't quite right or somehow God spoke to you that it wasn't right and you either ignored it or didn't pay attention and kind of just shuffled it off but if you didn't then here's the next step if you felt like something wasn't right then you kind of go hmm and if you turn to God and ask him Jesus said or the scripture says if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who abradeth not, but giveth to all men liberally. You would take that sense of something not right, and you would ask God, God, what's not right about this? You said and you promised that you would give me wisdom about this, so what's not right about this? So you asked God. Now, God promised he would give you wisdom. So in your personal relationship, however you have communication with him, he will reveal it to you my personal relationship, God always has revealed to me what's wrong with whatever it is that I asked him about what's right. But then I go beyond that. I ask, well, what not only is wrong with this, but what's the right about it? What should, what should be the right thing? And then why do they come to this? And I'm always given the source, you know, and the kind of the background, and I, God leads me in my searches on Google and Internet to find, you know, more information. And then, Bam, within five minutes, you know, I can find out just about everything I need to know, you know, about just about anything that's really kind of questionable that pops up. And then I'm amazed because I look at everyone else and I think, am I a genius? My wife can tell you I'm no genius, although she thinks so. She's blonde. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, but I'm no genius. I ask God. Of course I go to the best source available. Of course I use God first. Of course I ask Him and I depend upon Him explicitly, implicitly, and completely. Once He tells me, then I go to Google. <laughs> I like to know kind of like what's out there just in case, you know, because it's going to come back and He already know. And it does. And people always challenge and say, well, why are you doing this? Because in utmost, when we are seeking to be the utmost for his highest. We're always trying to develop our senses of the Holy Spirit leading us and guiding us. We want to be in personal communication with God intimately so that we aren't misled or miss the opportunity to share Jesus in a personal setting with someone who might be right in front of us. That's why we call it utmost because you're trying to be closer to God in a more intimate way than you've ever been before. You want to hear His voice, you want to walk in His way, you want to do His word, you want to know Him so well that you can have an expectation of what He would say in any given situation. And He'll still blow your mind because He'll come up with something new. But the point is you're pursuing Him and not the circumstance. You're pursuing Him and not the post. You're pursuing Him and not whatever it is in life that has confronted you in front of you. That's the issue. 
are you focused in on him? The overmastering direction, I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, Acts 26, 16. The vision Paul had on the road to Damascus was no passing motion, but a vision that had very clear and emphatic directions for him, and he says, I was not obedient, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Our Lord said in effect to Paul, your whole life is to be overmastered by me. You are to have no end, no aim, no purpose, but mine. I have chosen. When we are born again, we all have visions, if we are spiritual at all, of what Jesus wants us to be. And the great thing is to learn not to be disobedient to the vision, not to say that it cannot be attained. It is not sufficient to know that God has redeemed the world and redeemed... It is not sufficient to know that God has redeemed the world and to know that the Holy Spirit can make all that Jesus did effectual in me. That's good for me. That's wonderful, as a matter of fact. That's what salvation is. God saved me. But is salvation all there is just for me personally to abide in my own personal salvation and not do anything about it? I must have the basis of a personal relationship with him. Paul was not given a message or a doctrine to proclaim. He was brought into a vivid, personal, overmastering relationship to Jesus Christ. Because once I have that personal, overmastering relationship, that means that Jesus could speak to me and I could listen to him and he could tell me what he wants me to do. Like he did in the book of Acts when he said to the man whom Paul was going to go, it's blind, and he says, um, I'm sending you Paul, you know, and I want you to hang on to him for a while, you know, and, you know, take care of him, you know, and he says, uh, are you sure, Lord? You know, I heard that Paul kills Christians, you know, and I'm not so sure that you want him, you know, what do you want me to do, Lord? He says, don't worry about it. And so the man did. That's the only recorded instance of this man. We don't have any other knowledge of him, except that he had this conversation with God, and God spoke to him, and he spoke to God. Interesting. They had the conversation recorded in Scripture for you and I. That's what you're supposed to do. Converse. Book of Acts. After Jesus rose from the dead. Paul. You can find it. Verse 16 of Acts 26 is immensely commanding. To make you a minister and a witness is what was spoken to Paul. Paul was told he was going to witness. He was told he would minister. Paul was devoted to a person, not a cause. He was absolutely Jesus Christ, and he saw nothing else. He lived for nothing else. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. The issue I find so often is people have side issues. They take their vocation and they make it their avocation. Their vocation is meant to just provide funding for their living in some way. But in reality, God wants you to be a servant of His so He can lead you wherever He wants you to go. It could be in your vocation that your avocation of sharing God in every situation that you're in may come into play where you are a witness in your job or you're a witness in avenues that come through your job as you go out into the world or into different places. But God never intended that your vocation should be your God or should involve you in such a way that it is the Spirit of God giving you some type of good feelings because of your job. Like most men get wrapped up into their vocation and when they lose it, they lose their self-esteem. That's too much of what's not important and not enough of what really is. Your personal relationship with Jesus should guide you every day of your life. You should walk with God and talk with Him so that He can give you a vision, an overview of your entire life in some way and say to you, I want you to do this. I will be with you. I will train you. I will prepare you. I will show you. I will guide you. I will teach you. I will instruct you. But I want you to do this. And then don't Stop for anything until you're doing what he told you to do. Because if you are, then you're disobeying the vision he gave you. You're disavowing the purpose God has created you for. You are saying, in essence, 
I would rather be anti-Christ than for Christ. I would rather do my own thing than obey God in His thing for me to do. So you choose. What will you do? Will you be the utmost for His highest? Or will you be the uttermost for your utmost to become the most that you think you should be? Because you're focused on yourself and not on Him.